lecture-long section of the course, and a, and a difficult one, and an extremely useful one. And in order to uh, emphasize the extremely useful, uh, today we'll talk about its use, and in particular, uh, talking about sound and the auditory system. Uh, and depending on how quickly this goes, hopefully with a, you know, uh, uh, an ending note <laughs> that's musical. Uh, but we'll see where, where we get. So, first, uh, sound is traveling pressure waves in the air. So when you're hearing me, it's because there is a modulation of air pressure that's produced by my vocal apparatus. We're not going to talk about speech production today, but you know, all this stuff from you know lung and vocal cords and vocal tract is producing these sounds, which are modulations in time of pressure. In other words, it's a function of time. Okay? Just like these one-dimensional signals that we've been talking about. It's not sampled in time. If you record it, like on that device, it's sampled in time. Uh, but what's arriving at your ear is a continuous uh, signal in time. Uh, when it gets to your ear, it runs into all this stuff. Um, all this stuff uh, processes the sound and eventually delivers it to neurons that deliver it to your brain. So a uh, few things about just the mechanical part before you get to a neuron. So uh, you know we refer to this thing on the outside as the ear, but it's only a piece of the full uh, ear apparatus. The ear consists of this outer thing that's called the pinna, uh, the outer ear, uh, and the ear canal, which you stick Q-tips in if you do. Um, and then the middle ear, which is this little part over here, and then the inner ear. Um, each of these has a function, uh, which I will review relatively quickly. Um, so the outer ear and the ear canal in us are relatively static devices. Some of us can wiggle our ears a little bit. I'm not one of those. Um, you know, other animals, think of my dog or my cat, right, can lift up their ears and direct them towards sound so they can use them as a directional hearing device. Uh, ours are directional only in the sense that they're not symmetric. And so the sounds, for example, coming from the front or coming from the back are bumping into different parts of this loose stuff. And this loose stuff resonates to some sounds, not to others, absorbs some, reflects some. And so the quality of the sound entering your um, ear canal uh, will differ depending on where it's coming from. That's a useful cue to knowing uh, the direction sounds come from. Not the only cue, but this is not a lecture in a full audition, so I'm going to skip all that topic. Uh, but nevertheless, this is you know soft stuff. And you may remember from high school physics that uh, physical objects typically have resonant resonances, resonant frequencies, right? Think of, uh, you know, this is a rather hard thing, and this is a somewhat softer thing. You get a different frequency of sound coming off this thing than this thing, uh, because this is harder. Um, and similarly, this is kind of gooey biological stuff, so it's going to be resonant for really low frequencies, uh, meaning it'll absorb them, it'll move with them, and therefore not pass them into your inner ear. Uh, the uh, auditory canal is a tube, and I think I may have said this in another lecture, but I always forget about what I say when, uh, that a tube is just a passive device, uh, but it acts like a linear filter. So I'm talking to you, I know I'm talking to you, and my voice sounds different because there's this passive device in front of it. And this passive device has soft sides and a hole of a particular shape that may have a resonance because of its size. So if I make a smaller hole versus a bigger hole, it'll behave differently. But regardless, it changes the quality of my voice and it changes it in a linear systems way. It is a linear system. There's no nonlinearity in the way my skin is working with respect to the sound. If I double the sound, what comes out the other side of this hand tube is double the sound. If I do the sound a minute later, what comes out is the same sound a minute later. It's shift invariant. It follows all the rules of what we've been talking about, at least within the range of auditory signals that we're talking about. I mean, if I multiplied my voice by you know 10 million, uh, you know, my hands would yeah, it would change. But within the range we're talking about, it acts like a linear system, shift invariant system, which is to say it can be described with an impulse response, put a click in this one and see what comes out the other side. Or it can be described by the Fourier transform of that impulse response function, which is the MTF, the modulation transfer function. It says for each sine wave that I put in this end of this tube, how much of that sine wave comes out the other end? Is it amplified? Is it attenuated? by how much? Is it phase shifted? By how much? 
And in particular, the combination of this and this acts like a bandpass filter. And it acts like a bandpass filter with a peak transmission rate around 1,000 to 3,000 hertz, 1,000 to 3,000 cycles per second. Those are important frequencies because, as we'll see later, um, speech sounds range from the uh, fundamental frequency of your voice, which you know for males is typically lower than females, and you know for a, a low bass, singing a low bass note, it's you know say around 100 hertz. Um, but the part of the speech spectrum, the frequency range of uh, speech, if you 4A analyze it, the part of the speech spectrum that is most useful for discriminating speech sounds, which phoneme am I speaking in, ah, uh, e, o, or u, that range is basically one to three kilohertz. So one thing the outer ear is doing is emphasizing the frequencies that are most useful for understanding speech. Um, the next, I don't I remember how these go. Okay, so the next part is the middle ear. So here's a bit of a blow up of the middle ear. Uh, so the middle ear is these three little bones. They're called the ossicles, which means little bones. Uh, and there are three little bones in there, the malleus, incus, and stapes. Uh, that's you know Latin or something for hammer, uh, anvil, and stirrups, because they vaguely look like a hammer, and anvil, and a stirrups. Um, and those, again, filter the sound a little bit. You know, they act like a linear system. Um, there are a couple other things that happen in there. Um, there um, are two different uh, places, oh, in between, of course, is the eardrum. So the sound comes in, vibrates the eardrum, which vibrates this bone, which pushes this bone, which pushes this bone, which vibrates another piece of tissue here. So this is the eardrum, and this is called the oval window, so these are little you know, membranes, okay? So you're trans transferring energy from this membrane to this membrane. Now, um, a few things happen in the middle ear. Uh, one is, uh, as I recall, the malleus, and I think there's a, a stapedius muscle, muscle connected to the stapes. Um, there are mechanisms in there to protect the inner ear from really loud sounds, which includes self-utterances when you're speaking, um, things tighten up so that your own voice is not transmitted back into your inner ear too strongly. But also, if you're in a really loud environment, the modulation transfer, just the absolute level of modulation transfer, is reduced. There's gain control in the ear to protect your inner ear from sounds being too loud. Um, finally, there's a couple of things that are happening here that are quite important. This is air. This is an airfield chamber on the other side of your eardrum, and you want the pressure on both sides the same, and if you have a cold and fly a plane, it hurts because the pressure stops being the same on either side. So that's why you yawn or cough or swallow or whatnot, trying to open up uh, other openings to this region in order to equalize the pressure. But in any case, over here is air. Over here is air and these little bones connected to each other. On the other side of the open window, in the inner ear, the cochlea, this is called, is water. Okay? So you have air out here, which is compliant. If I Know, give you a plunger and an air-filled tube and you try to close the thing and compress the air, you can do that. But if that same container was filled with water and you tried to compress it, you wouldn't get anywhere, right? So the compressibility of fluid is very different than the compressibility of air, which means that the energy transfer that goes when a mechanical signal in air meets water is quite weak. So you're on the diving board and your friend is under the water in the swimming pool and you shout to your friend and your friend doesn't hear you. Where does the sound go? Well, vibrations of air meet the water. The water is not compliant and so they reflect right back to you. So you get an echo. It's so fast you don't hear it as an echo. But the point being is very little of the energy is transferred to the water. Uh, this mechanism here is all about energy transfer. So there's two pieces that are going on here. One is you're taking the energy over a very large area, and with the little bones, you're concentrating it over a much smaller area. Okay, so you get a mechanical advantage from going from large area to small area. Also, the arrangement of the little bones acts a little bit like a crowbar, like a lever, meaning a large movement of this leads to a small movement of that. And you know, so like a crowbar, so who's the Greek that said with a large enough uh, you know, my lay lever, I could lift the world. Archimedes, thank you. I never remember that. <coughs> um, so this is the same deal. So between uh, both mechanisms, the energy transfer from air to water is improved by a large factor. Um, I don't think I have a slide for this, um, but.
but in the sound, we refer to sounds using a log scale of intensity, decibels, dB. And you've seen dB on the specs of your stereos if you've ever looked at the specs of a stereo uh, about energy transfer uh, to your loudspeakers or whatever. So decibels are a log scale where 20 decibels uh, means an increase in pressure by a factor of 10. So 30 dB is by 10 square root of 10, so about 30-ish. And so there's a 30-fold increase in the efficiency, the effectiveness of transfer of energy from air to water by right of what's happening here. So that's mostly what's happening, is trying to get more energy into the water on the other side. There's a little bit of filtering, again emphasizing uh, uh, frequencies that are good for speech. Okay, then you get to the inner ear. So the inner ear, oh, by the way, this whole bunch of stuff here um, is not an organ that I can like take out and show to you and, and you know put on a plate. Uh, because what this organ is, is a snail-shaped uh, cavity in your skull. So it's inside of, it's surrounded by bone. So it's not a thing that you can take out. It's, it's embedded in your skull. And um, these two and a half turns of uh, the cochlea, cochlea, by the way, is, means snail. <laughs> so all these, all these names are, are just exactly what you think they are. It has these two and a half turns, and now I'm going to show you a cross-section of what the cochlea looks like. So if I took a cut across one of those turns, uh, here's what it looks like. So it's a water-filled organ. Uh, it has three separate regions separated by membranes. This is the region that was a, at the very front end connected to the middle ear, where that, there was that oval window. And so the oval window is going back and forth because the bones are pushing it, which leads to vibration of this fluid, which is mostly water. Um, it goes through those two and a half turns, I'm going to go back, goes through those two and a half turns, and at the innermost turn called the helicotrema, the upper canal and the lower canal are actually connected to each other. So they're actually the same fluid. The middle uh, area, the cochlear duct, is, set, is a separate region that it does not you know, leak into the other two. But these are two are connected, which means if you push in here, there's a pressure wave that goes all the way in here, then comes all the way back out the tympanic canal, which means it needs a release. There's another window here called the uh, round window that, you know, this pushes in, this can push out. So just a little bit of string release, as it were. Okay? All right, so you got these three regions, and in it, water is causing, uh, is, is being vibrated by sound. Okay? And inside here, uh, right here is a membrane which is called the basilar membrane, the base membrane, on which all the neurons sit. The inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. Don't need to go through all the full anatomy, but these are receptors. These are neurons that receive mechanical input and convert that to an electrical output. Um, and they're sitting on the basilar membrane, which is to say, if the water's shaking, if that shakes the basilar membrane, that will shake these neurons, and then I'll shake parts of the neurons that lead to an input to the brain. Uh, here it is blown up a little bit further. So I call them hair cells. Why? Because they got these little hairs here. And the little hairs are projecting out into the cochlear ducts fluid. And so the idea is you got, um, slides are on here, so I don't think I've got a, any better slides. So I'll just, I'll just demonstrate this way. So here's a neuron. On top of it are rows of little teeny hairs, right? And those little teeny hairs, you know, they're just they're little teeny hairs. They're connected to each other. The tips of them are connected to each other with a single molecule called the tip link. It's a protein. And if the fluid shakes them, such that the hairs are going back and forth, uh, what happens is in the back, in one direction, the, the tip links, which act kind of like springs, uh, get pulled on because the, the hairs are, are arranged like this. And so in one direction, there's a shear force. In one direction, the tips get closer together. In the other direction, they get further apart. When they get further apart, that leads to an opening of ion channels, which leads ions to flow in, which leads to a change in voltage, which then gets transmitted to other neurons. So that's transduction. Those are neurons that trans transduce a mechanical force into a change into electrical potential, into voltage. Okay? And that's the stuff of neural communication. So from there on, uh, that gets communicated through the next neurons down the line to the brain. That leads to hearing. Okay? Um, Brief aside, I just told you that this whole apparatus of hearing depends on little tiny hairs which are connected by a single molecule. You might imagine it's rather delicate. 
in the best of circumstances for hearing, adapted to absolute quiet in a quiet chamber, play a frequency that's the one to which you are most sensitive, about three kilohertz in fact, somewhere between one and three kilohertz, close to about 2,500. Uh, play that sound to you. Do a psychophysical experiment to find out what is the quietest sound you can hear. And the estimate is that when that happens, the hair cells that are producing the signal that is allowing you to, that are allowing you to just barely hear that sound, those hair, hairs are wiggling back and forth by a distance that's on the order of the size of a hydrogen atom. In the best of circuits and circumstances, you are exquisitely sensitive to sound, which might make you wonder, again, from that decibel scale, so let's call that zero dB. At 110 dB, that's sitting in front of the speakers at a good rock concert, okay? So that's a factor of more than five orders of magnitude higher, 100,000, 300,000 higher in pressure wave amplitude, which means these guys are going back and forth like this, and they're breaking and dying. So it's a dad moment. Don't do that to yourselves. Wear your protection. You know, if you like to walk around with an iPod, you know, with your phone in your ears, iPod, I just dated myself. Um, <laughs> I owned one once. Walkman. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, Discman. <laughs> um, so, um, point is, they die and they don't regrow. So we all lose hair cells with age. Uh, some of you may have known about that uh, cell phone ring at about 18 kilohertz, which teenagers can hear and their parents can't. You know, nice, nice you know, little trickery that you can do. So we all lose from the high frequency end with age. Uh, you know, yes, I've lost a lot more than you have. I probably peak out at about 14 kilohertz and you guys are probably more like 18. But just to let you know, when you were five, you made it to 20. So you're already losing it. Um, in any case, yeah? Um, this whole process seems to happen pretty quickly. Has anyone characterized the latency from eardrum vibration to actual perception? Uh, my guess is, uh, well, that for sure. That for sure. But the interesting part, way off to the side of what I'm going to talk about today, so we talked about directional hearing. Yeah, we talked about directional, directional hearing, like I can face my ears different ways and tell. But the main cues for directional hearing, if it sounds coming from the right, it gets directly to this ear, it's blocked by my head, so it'll be quieter in this ear, so that's an interaural intensity difference. But also, it has farther to travel to get here. So that's an interaural timing difference. And you are, so this is not about how fast it gets to the brain, but one uh, brain area past the, the, the ear, Um, so just about two synapses later, is an area where the timing difference is measured. And the timing difference, obviously, here is zero, because it's equal distance. And over here is a little under a millisecond. Um, so if you can tell the difference between here and here from a timing difference, we're talking about 80, millise 80 microseconds. Differences can be sensed by neurons. So your ability to handle differential timing between the two ears it's pretty exquisite for biological stuff. It's, it's quite good. Um, and the way, well, okay, I won't. This is not from the side, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Um, anyway, all right, so that's the stuff of how hearing takes place. Now, the basilar membrane um, uh, is this, you know, it's, a, it's, it's this membrane the width of the cochlea, but it goes all the way along the cochlea, along those two and a half turns. If I were to unroll it, um, it acts like a big, long membrane that's getting powered at one end, the oval window, uh, and that is kind of tied off at the other end. It's also held on its sides. So long branch membranes, when they uh, are powered, they create a, what's called a standing wave. Now I'm going to undress and I'm going to demonstrate this. Hold the other end. Here is a belt. It is a long membrane made out of biological stuff. If I put a side wave on this side, I get a standing wave. This is going up and down. This is and down, this is going up and at a different time. That's a standing wave, okay? There's a difference with basilar membrane. This belt is the same stuff, the same thickness, the same width, all along its length. Basilar membrane, on the other hand, uh, is not that way. At the oval window, it is stiff and narrow, which means as a linear system or as a resonant physical object, it is resonant to high 
frequencies. At the helicotremo, it's wide and floppy, which means its resonance frequency is low. So what that means is that the standing wave that you get will not have the same amplitude everywhere. And where its highest amplitude will depend on what frequency you play. If you play a low frequency, the peak is going to be near the helicotremo. If you have play a high frequency, the peak is going to be near the oval window, which is to say the basilar membrane computes a blurred Fourier transform mechanically. Think about that. All this math we've been doing, and we have a piece of goo in your skull that does the math <laughs> for you, real time, instantaneously, all the time, and it's how you hear. So audition works by supplying the brain at every moment in time with a sloppy Fourier transform of the incoming auditory signal. Okay? So you get this traveling wave. This, is meant, this image is meant to be you know, like a snapshot in time, uh, but it obviously moves uh, with time, but it gives you a feel that it's higher in one region than another. Now, if you take multiple snapshots in time, you'll see a traveling wave. So one, two, and three are meant to be two to three different instants in time. Uh, so you know, now the peak of the traveling wave is here, now the peak of the traveling wave is here, now here. And you know, eventually, these will become peaks a little while later, assuming that it's a periodic sound, a repeating sound. Um, and this is meant to be, I'm playing a sine wave, and this is what you get for the sine wave. And so the idea is, this part of the basilar membrane is going to go up, down, up, down, up, down, with this amplitude, the dashed line. This part of the basilar membrane is also going to go up, down, and up, down. Not at the same time, out of phase. Because while this one's up, you can see this one's down. So it'll be out of phase. Uh, but this one will also be going up and down, but with a smaller amplitude. Way over here, it'll be going up, down, up, down, with a smaller ap amplitude. So it acts like a linear system. You put a sine wave in, and every part of the basilar membrane acts like a linear si uh, system. You get a sine wave out with a phase shift that depends on where you are along here and what frequency is being played, and with an amplitude that also depends on where you are here, which is to say that the impulse response, the impulse response is Fourier transform, otherwise known as the MTF, is different here than here. Each piece of the basilar membrane has an MTF, and they differ in the sense that they're all bandpass filters, but the peak frequency of bandpass, the thing that is its frequency preference, differs. Down here it's for high frequencies, up here it's for low frequencies and it continuously varies along the basilar membrane. So here's what it will look like as a standing wave in a cartoon. So this would be for a high frequency. And so any given region, you have to pick a place, you know, here, it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. This one's going up and down more, this one's going up and down more, this one's going up and down less. Okay. Um, okay. But the peak amplitude position along the basilar membrane. This is where along the basilar membrane. Here's the oval window. The other end, uh, about three and a half centimeters in, two and a half turns in, uh, is the helicotrema, the innermost turn. And so for a low frequency turn, uh, a sound about like this, um, you're all the way towards the helicotrema. And for, you know, uh, two octaves la later, so not the, uh, uh, that's the 400 about here, and I'm not going to attempt to get to 1600, I'm not capable. Um, and so you get these standing waves, but where they are is going to depend on the frequency. These are cartoons, don't take them too seriously, but that's the general idea. This is oval window, this is helicotrema. This is low frequency near the helicotrema, this is much higher frequency closer to the oval window. So if you plot the envelope of that standing wave, so the max amplitude, you know, the, the, the max deviation for a fixed sine wave, for sine waves of different frequencies, really low ones, the peaks are you know, extremely low ones, like tw at 25 hertz, you don't just hear it, you can feel it. Um, uh, it peaks at the helicotrema, but as the frequency uh, increases, uh, the peak moves cl closer and closer uh, to the oval window. Now, an aspect of that to which we'll return much later today is how the frequencies are laid out. So here is uh, you know, the two and a half turns with the peak frequency marked upon it. And so let's see what's happening here. So uh, here we are at 100, uh, and then we go a half turn, and we're at 200, and then we go a little more than a half turn. 
turn, we're at 800, a little more half turn, we're at, sorry, 400, then a little more half turn, we're at 800, a little more half turn, we're at 1600, a little more half a turn, we're at 3200, a little more half a turn, and we're, well, not quite at 6400. Uh, what kind of a scale is this? A scale of frequency. What would you call a scale that acts that way, where our fixed distances are doubling? If you plotted it, what kind of scale have you put on the x-axis? Yeah, this is logarithmic. Frequency in all mammalian audition is encoded logarithmically, which is say a fixed distance along the basilar membrane is a fixed multiplication of the frequency. Doubling is always moving along by, I don't know, six millimeters. I'm making up the number, but approximately. Okay? So that's kind of interesting. And this idea that perception, not just the mechanics, this is just a mechanical description of the basilar membrane, but perception of frequency is also logarithmic. It's the basis of what all music, Western, Eastern, whichever, uh, is the fact that frequency is encoded logarithmically. I will talk about that later. Okay, so then if you go to the neurons just after that and ask for any given neuron, so now we're talking about the auditory nerve, you stick in an electrode, uh, you know, not in a human, but in an animal preparation, and you put your electrode near the auditory nerve, and you pick out a single nerve fiber, and then you play um, sounds to the animal and measure uh, spikes per second um, on that nerve fiber and ask, you know, how loud does that sound have to be in order to achieve a fixed response from the auditory nerve fiber that you're listening to? Um, so this is uh, a effectively a sensitivity curve. And so the idea is, if it takes very, very little input to get that neuron spiking, you know, 20 spikes per second, then that's a place where it's sensitive. If it requires a much louder sound, uh, then that's where it's insensitive. So on the x-axis, so these are different nerve fibers. Um, does it even say what animal it is? Probably a guinea pig. Huh? Does it say that? In that cat. Oh, I went right past it. Okay. Interesting they do it in the cat. Most uh, auditory physiology is done in this little, you know, free rooting thing. Um, in any case, um, you know, so these are different neurons that are obviously tuned for different frequencies. Tuned. Bottom here means you need very little uh, sound energy to get the neuron firing. So that's high sensitivity. So what you're seeing here is a plot of bandpass filters. They're plotted upside down because this is not a plot of sensitivity. It's a plot of threshold, right? Low threshold is good. Sensitive. High threshold is bad. Not only that, but these are very narrow bands. Now, why do I know that? Well, first of all, we've got to look at the axes carefully. Um, you know, what is this axis? 4, 9, 16. Uh, this is kind of a general logarithmic axis over here. And this is definitely a logarithmic axis because this is in decibels. Meaning, every time you go up by 20 dB, you increase the pressure modulation by a factor of 10. So you need, in order to go over a frequency just this much, you need ten time, more than 10 times as much uh, modulation and pressure. To go over this much, you need <laughs> like 100,000 times as much. So these are very narrow band filters. Um, now, the narrow bandedness of them uh, uh, comes from a couple of things. Um, if you measured this in a dead animal, neural responses in a dead animal. So if you measure the basilar membrane vibration in a dead animal, you would get wider tuning curves. So the mechanics are actually wider than that. They are narrowed in two different ways. Uh, they're narrowed, number one, uh, the um, brain has a feedback loop. Uh, let's go way back here to here. Um, talked about there being these inner hair cells and these outer hair cells. Uh, the inner hair cells and outer hair cells differ anatomically. In particular, the hairs on the outer hair cells have in them, uh, <coughs> I always thought it was actin, but I may be misremembering which protein it is, but they have a protein in them that is analogous to proteins in muscles, which is to say, and I don't have it here, but in the undergraduate class, this is lovely, um, silly video from an auditory physiologist where they play rock around the clock and inject that as current into an outer hair cell, and it sits there wiggling with the feet. Okay, the hairs are, are muscles, and if you give them input, they will flex. And so there's a feedback loop from uh, inner hair 
cells to outer hair cells that adds vibration to the local region. And that feedback loop actually amplifies at the preferred frequency, thus effectively making for a narrower filter. Second, by the time you get to the auditory nerve, there is a consequence that physiologically is rampant throughout all the different sensory modalities called lateral inhibition, which is to say my output is excited by my preferred uh, input neurons, but inhibited by neighboring neurons. Now, on the basilar membrane, neighboring, meaning further towards the helicotrema or further towards the oval window, means not merely neighboring you know, geographically, basilotopically, but it also means neighboring in preferred frequency. So I'm excited by the frequency that my input neuron likes, but I'm also inhibited by neurons that have neighboring preferred frequencies, which effectively, again, gives you narrower tuning curves than you would have gotten just pure mechanically by the fact that the basilar membrane gets floppier as you go in. Okay? So all of that is a system designed to do a linear system at each place along the basilar membrane, linear for reasonable signals. Obviously, if the signal gets incredibly intense, it'll stop acting it linearly. But it acts like a linear system. It acts like a filter. Here's a picture of the filter upside down. Um, there, there are other ways to measure it. I'm not even sure why this slide's in here, so I'm going to skip it. Um, oh, this slide's in here saying, here are uh, tuning curves of different neurons uh, measured physiologically. Here are tuning curves uh, measured psychophysically in a behavioral experiment. Uh, how do you do that? So, suppose I'm listening to this neuron to do a task. You know, the task is, do you hear boop? Except, I'm going to make it hard for you because I'm going to put that boop in an environment where it might be masked, where there's another sound that you're not asked to detect that's always present. Um, but you're being asked, is this sine wave been added to this mask? And so the mask will be a noise, um, a narrow band noise with different frequencies in it that will be varied over trials. And sometimes the mask will be a shh that's similar in frequency to the boop. And sometimes it'll be, it'll be lower frequency than the boop, or maybe it'll be much higher frequency than the boop. Okay? And the question is, how effective is the mask in making the beep harder to hear? So that's what's plotted here, is how much mask intensity do I need to raise threshold by a fixed amount? So it's like a sensitivity curve, now it's sensitivity to the mask, by the mechanism you're using to hear the, the, the sine wave. So if the mechanism were listening to a single auditory nerve, that won't be true because you've got lots of them that are useful to you, but however it is you're pooling the input in order to detect the sine wave, if the mask gets into that, the set of mechanisms you're listening to, they will make it the, the beep harder to hear. And the idea is that when the mask is similar to the test, it, you need very little mask in order to raise the threshold for hearing the beep. But as the mask gets further and further away, uh, you need more and more of it by many beep. The same with, with the mask being higher than it. So there's a couple things to notice here. Um, one is they're awfully similar looking, both in bandwidth and in shape. You notice that the cutoff is really fast at the high frequency end, and the cutoff is really uh, broad at the low frequency end. That is a consequence directly of of this. Look at the shapes of these um, these envelopes. When you play a frequency, there is a very broad. Uh, side to the envelope here and a very sharp one at the amplitude here, which means as the thing moves this away, if you're here, you know, responding to this sound, so uh, let's, let's pick here, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm on the basilar membrane here, and when you play a low frequency sound, I get an input, a higher frequency sound, I get a higher input, higher, but it's, it's gradually increasing. So my response is increasing as the frequency is increasing until the frequency passes me by and then it drops rapidly which means that my cutoff on the high frequency side should be sharp, and my cutoff on the low frequency side should be shallow, which is exactly what you see both neurally and behaviorally. Sharp cutoff on the high frequency side, shallow cutoff on the low frequency side. That comes straight out of the mechanics of the basilar membrane. 
neural processing is not required to give you filters that are shaped like this. Okay, so how do we uh, know about this stuff behaviorally? Well, so this is already um, a kind of a uh, method for asking what are the filters that you use in hearing and asking about it in a behavioral experiment. So there are, uh, let me draw some of this stuff, yeah. So um, here's the idea. Um, suppose this is frequency, oh, that's not a very good one. What's a good one? Try this. Try the other one. Okay. Suppose, suppose this is frequency. Suppose I ask you to do an experiment where you're trying to detect sound. And suppose I'll, I'll pick a sound, you know, right here. This is the frequency you're being asked to hear. And I'm going to ask what happens when I vary conditions to make it hard for you to hear. So I'm going to measure the threshold for this sound alone. So this is just a boop, and I'm going to make it really, really quiet so you can just barely hear it. I'll do it in some kind of forced choice experiment where there's two temporal intervals, one has a sound, one doesn't have to have a sound, and you have to tell me which interval has the sound. Maybe I indicate the intervals by a, uh, a light on a screen so you know when to listen. Okay? And so I measure how loud does that sound have to be in the best of conditions. You're in a quiet room, there's no echoes, you can't hear any people walking down the hallway because you're in a room where you close the door and there's like layers of egg crate uh, styrofoam around you or whatever. So you're in an isolated chamber and you measure threshold. Okay, here's how much threshold is. Okay? Now, I make it harder to hear because in those two intervals, there will be a noise, a shh. And I'll ask, what happens when I mask you as a function of aspects of the mask? So there are various ways to run this experiment. Uh, one of them uh, uh, that I, I can talk about with this experiment, uh, the standard one, which is called critical band masking, is there's two different ways to run it. Oh, I have the eraser so I can do this. Um, one way to do it is I put a masker. So maybe this is the masker. And when I draw this rectangle here, I'm saying I'm playing a noise that has equal energy from this frequency to this frequency. Okay? And the y-axis is, you know, how much amplitude it has. And then on top of that, in one interval, I'll add that sine wave, and in the other interval I won't, and you're trying to detect the sine wave. Okay? So I do that for this noise. I also do that for this noise. I also do that for this noise. I also do that for this noise. And the way I'm drawing these noises, I'm trying to preserve the area of those rectangles, meaning the total energy in the noise. Okay? So if I'm going to make it broader, I'm going to give it lower amplitude, such that the area, meaning the total energy of the masker, will be maintained. And so I'm making it wider and wider bands that are always the same amount of energy. So imagine that you are listening to this sound with some mechanism. Now I'm using abstract psychophysics terms, but you can think of that mechanism being pool across a bunch of auditory nerve fibers and pay attention to the signal coming out of them. Ignore other auditory nerve fibers that you don't need because they're not sensitive to the signal. Okay? So the, here's the target, the target that we're trying to listen for. Uh, and all this other stuff is noise that's just getting in the way. So imagine you're listening to this with some filter shaped like what I was showing you before, but I'm going to be, you know, lazy about it, say maybe the filter looks like this. Auditory filter or mechanism. Suppose that's what I'm listening to it. So when I go from, you know, noise A to noise B, all of A's energy um, is inside this mechanism. And if I went narrower still, you know, all of that noise would be, the mechanism would be very sensitive to it. So the noise would be stimulating this mechanism, making the target harder to hear. It'd be a very effective mask. By the time I get to B, some of this energy is starting to hit places where that mechanism is less sensitive. And so that mask will start becoming less effective. And this will become less effective still. And so if you plot threshold elevation as a function of bandwidth, bandwidth being the width of these little rectangles, but really skinny.
skinny ones, I can make them wider, and the threshold elevation, uh, sorry, probably the wrong way, um, elevation won't change. If I make it a little lower, a little wider, as long as it's right near the peak of the tuning curve, the threshold's hardly going to change at all. But when the energy in the mask, some of it is distributed outside the filter you're using, that means that mechanism doesn't hear that part of the noise. That means the effective amplitude of the noise as far as this mechanism is concerned is starting to go down, which means its ability to impede your hearing of the thing you're listening for will go down. And so it'll go like this. And so this frequency will be called the critical band. Hence the name critical band masking. And so the idea is we're measuring a filter with a behavioral experiment. Or say, the filter you use to hear this frequency has a bandwidth approximately of that. And if we do that, and we do that for you know, 200 hertz tones, 1,000 hertz tones, 4,000 hertz tones, what we'll find is that the width of this critical band is proportional to the frequency being detected, which is to say that the filters are arranged logarithmically. Want to hear a sound that's five times higher in frequency? You're using a filter that's five times wider in linear frequency terms. Okay, and the basilar membrane, as you saw, was arranged mechanically in millimeters logarithmic, which means that the filters are a fixed width on the basilar membrane. The filters, you know, could you could say the filter around 200 hertz goes from you know one. 80 to 220, and the filter around 2,000 hertz goes from 1,800 to 2,200. I'm making up the numbers, but they're comparable to the right answer. Okay, so I've just multiplied the width by 10. But those two widths can also be measured in millimeters on the basilar membrane. And on millimeters on the basilar membrane, they're identical. So it's as if the basilar membrane is wired up the same way all along its length, but because the mechanics spread out frequencies logarithmically, that means all the filtering problem, pro properties act in a logarithmic fashion as well. Um, another way the experiment to, to run the experiment is loudness summation. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, and so I'm going to draw the same noises again, but I want to get rid of the target because the target is no longer involved. Um, but, but I will leave up this part. Um, OK, so I'm going to have these same noises. Noise. Noise, 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 noise. And where these noises are all equal area, and they're going to sound qualitatively different to you. You know, the one that's really narrow will almost sound like a musical pitch, not quite. It'll sound like a noisy musical pitch. But as it gets wider, it'll sound more like, you know, it'll, it'll sound like a noise. Okay? But the question is a very qualitative kind of experiment. Those of you in perception heard me talking about qualitative experiments. Go. Uh, and it's a very qualitative experiment. Experiment is to say, how loud does it sound to you? I know it sounds qualitatively differently, qualitatively different. It doesn't sound like the same sound. But the question is, what's the perceived loudness? And what you will find, so let me put this back. Critical band experiment went like this, and there was the critical band. So now I'm going to change, I'm going to have another axis over here, which is perceived loudness. And so I'm going to plot another experiment on the same graph. Uh, which is, how loud does it sound to you as you make the sounds wider and wider bandwidth, as you proceed from this to this to this to this, the same mask that we were using last time. And so what you get for that experiment is this. Uh, am I doing this right? Yeah. So it turns out that if the energy is getting into a single filter, how loud it appears to you is a function of how much that filter is stimulated, which means that if you stimulate it with a narrow thing or a wider thing, but you're stimulating that filter exactly the same amount, loudness doesn't change. But when now you're stimulating that filter less, but you're stimulating other, other filters as well, so now you're not just summating energy within a filter, which seems to treat, be treated like a linear system, it just adds energy. But now you are combining energy to this filter to this other filter further down the basilar membrane or this other filter closer to the oval window. And so this, this filter you started with is now getting energized less, but now other filters are getting recruited. It turns out that perceptually, that's louder. 
And both these methods measure the same filter and give you approximately the same answer as to how wide that filter is. These are very different psychophysical techniques to get at the idea of if we're going to treat the auditory system as a collection of linear systems, auditory nerve fibers or other neurons down the line that are effectively stimulated by different portions of the basilar membrane, uh, if we're going to treat it uh, like a linear system, then you want to know what is the modulation transfer function of that linear system, or of each of those linear systems, because we don't have one, we have several. And once you take those linear filters and then do stuff with them to combine them, at that point you may be doing nonlinear stuff. Here you're clearly doing nonlinear stuff. Okay, you're combining across linear filters and you're combining them in a nonlinear way. Otherwise, energy would just keep adding. But that's not what happens. Um, and so it starts out as a linear system, and then one might want to examine the properties of what happens when it becomes nonlinear. Okay. Next. Suppose I wanted to uh, use linear systems theory not just to say, oh, interesting, this, this uh, system of hearing is a linear system, but suppose I wanted to model what it does. So I want to model these filters. I want to approximate them with some curve of some uh, linear filter that could represent what's actually happening at each place along the basilar membrane. In order to do that, I need to build up a model. And models for one-dimensional filters uh, you know, come from my field. I was uh, raised as an electrical engineer initially when I was an undergrad. I was really a computer scientist, but back then there was no computer science department, so I was a double E, so I took courses and stuff like this. Okay? And stuff like this is circuits. Okay? And we often use circuits because we actually build stuff like circuits, but we often also use circuits as models for um, you know, other uh, things that we can build or that we are given. Uh, so the circuit we're going to talk about here is, you know, a very uh, standard first thing you get in EE or first thing you get in an engineering department's course in differential equations. Uh, we've been pushing your math in this course further than you may have made it to go, and I'm not going to do a course in differential equations. You know, perish the thought. That's enough already. Uh, but I'm going to give you at least an intuition for how the system works. So first of all, let's just talk about what's in front of us. So what's in front of us is a schematic of a circuit. And the circuit consists of two components, a resistor, that's the squiggly line here, and a capacitor, that's this line. A resistor is something where if you want to push electrons through it, it resists. Okay? And so in order to get enough electrons to flow through it, the, pre the voltage difference on either side of it needs to be big. Okay? The bigger the voltage difference, the more current flows, the more electrons get through. Uh, the bigger the resistance, the bigger the value of R for a fixed voltage, the less will go through it because it's resisting. That's all a resistor is. It's a linear component. If you double the voltage, you get double the output. Uh, if you, it's uh, shift invariant. If you apply that voltage a minute later, you get that current a minute later. So it is a linear system, very, very simple one. It just is a scale factor. Next component is this guy called a capacitor. It has this, you know, picture here. The picture is meant to look like what a capacitor actually is, which is two pieces of metal that aren't touching each other, with an insulator in between. So electrons don't actually get to flow across it. But if you get a lot of negative charges on one side, because of physics, positive charges will be attracted to the other side. And the bigger the plates are, the more effectively that will happen. So the, how big the plates are and how close they are together is how effective you get this, uh, this effect of as charge builds up on this side, it causes opposite charge to want to build up on the other side. So that's capacitance. The letter C is a number saying how big are those plates and how close are they together. Okay, so what that means is that as you, um, um, you know, try to push current here, that current gets integrated by the capacitor leading to a voltage across the capacitor that integrates the electrons that you've given it. The more electrons you give it, the more positive charge that comes to the other side, the more you build up a difference in voltage on either side of the capacitor. Voltage is the potential for current to flow. Current is actual, current, uh, actual electrons moving. So the capacitor acts like, take an integral. Now, integral of function A plus function B is integral of function A plus integral of function B. You'll learn that in the little bit of calculus you may have had. Otherwise known as an integral of A times
times function is a times the integral of the function, otherwise known as the integral is a linear system. The same rules, the derivative of function a plus function b is the derivative of function a plus the derivative of function b, the derivative is a linear system. And if it's a function of time, it's also shift invariant. If you shift the function later, the derivative does the same thing. If you shift the function later, the integral does the same thing. So those are linear shift invariant systems. So this circuit is a linear shift invariant system. So you can solve what does this system do. And so you see that you know this guy's taking the integral of this. Um, or alternatively, uh, you can shift the integral to the other side and saying that the voltage, the derivative of the voltage gives you the current. These are equivalent statements. Okay? Um, and then you can ask, what's the difference between the voltage at the input and the voltage at the output? So the difference between the voltage and the, uh, and the input and the voltage at the output is how much voltage gets wasted on this resistor. How much does this guy do that? And the, um, the resistor's function says the voltage you get is current times resistance, meaning if the resistance is high, the current is low. If the resistance is low, the current is high. That's why it's equal to four. Okay? And so you put all this together, and you end up getting the uh, difference in the output from the input is the derivative of the input. So it turns into what's called the differential equation. It's an equation of something that we'd like to know y, which has y in it just as y, but also has y in it as the derivative of y. And so you say, what function will satisfy this? And so you can take a whole cast of differential equations I did back in 1972 or something. Uh, they all remember it. Uh, but here's the answer of what you get. Now, I'm not going to say how I got there, but calculus, what's the derivative of e to the whatever? The derivative of e to the whatever is e to the whatever times the constant, 1 over tau. Okay? If you substitute in that, the tau's cancel, and it works. Okay? So what does all this say? This says that this circuit is effectively uh, has a impulse response. If you kick it, what comes out the other side is an exponential. Okay? All this work just says, here's a circuit which has an impulse response, meaning if you, you just pinged it, you raise the voltage instantly and then turn it back off and said, what is going to be the result of doing that? The result is going to be an exponential. Okay? It's a, it's a circuit, it's a thing. Its impulse response has to be causal, has to go forward in time. And so the idea is this is a circuit where if what you put in was this, in, what you get out is this. Now, when you draw an exponential, there's lots of exponentials you could have drawn. Exponentials are described as e to the minus t over tau. When t equals tau, it goes down by 1 over e. So, you, so it starts at whatever height it is. That's how hard you kicked it. But it go, when it goes down to 1 over e, 1 over e, e being 2.71, blah, blah, blah. OK, just some number. Okay, when it goes down to 1 over e, that's the time constant of this device. So if it drops really fast, if tau is small, tau is small. If it drops really slow, tau is big. Now, that is going to get convolved with your input, which means you flip it around and you multiply and sum. That's convolution. Which means the current output is going to be an average over a bunch of the previous input. Not much of the previous input if tau is short. Lots of the previous input if tau is long. So when tau is long, it's blurring the hell out of the input, which is what this is meant to show. So if the input is this spiky thing, and if tau is long enough, you get out something much smoother. So it is a low-pass filter. It's clearly acting as a low-pass filter. And you know it's a low-pass filter because its impulse response is only positive. So it's effectively taking a, a weighted average of the past, which is blurring. Okay. Uh, and it's a causal filter, which means it's also adding a time delay to any signal. Right? If you kick it, your response is spread way over time. If you give it some interesting thing like a sine wave, the peak of the sine wave and the output is going to be a little bit later. It's going to be it's going to have involve phase delays. Okay, so that's a filter. And it's a causal filter, something you can actually build. And it's not just any filter, it's just the most standard filter you could ever talk about. It's used, for example, in neural science to describe uh, the cable equation. So neurons have axons, or dendrites, which are just cables of stuff. And the 
outside of a membrane versus the inside acts like a capacitor. There's voltage inside, there's voltage outside, and there's an insulator in between, which is the membrane, that acts like a capacitance. Inside, there's fluid, and current wants to flow, but if the dendrite's really tiny as opposed to a big fat axon, then current flow is more difficult, so it acts like a resistor. So you've got a resistor going this way and a capacitor going this way. Each little section of a biological membrane acts like this circuit and is modeled this way and behaves with signals this way. If you have a whole long cable, well, it's got lots of little pieces of this, each of which will act this way. So it's not just you know something you build out of circuits and you know have in your phone. Uh, you know, it's uh, something that can model biological stuff. Now, if we want to design a filter, uh, then we want to know how it works in the frequency domain. So if you take a circuit which behaves this way, and then you ask, what is its modulation transfer function? Meaning, you take that exponential, and you calculate the Fourier transform, and you calculate it the way uh, MATLAB wants to do it, which is to say you get out complex numbers. And those complex numbers, as a function of frequency, have a very simple form, this. So it's 1 over 1 plus something proportional to frequency. So this is a frequency in radians. Um, but you could do the, you know, if you want to do the discrete Fourier transform, you could do the 2 pi f, you know, f over n thing that we did all the last three weeks. Um, tau is the time constant, which is to say if the time constant is long, this has a big number in the denominator. If the time constant is small, there's a small number in the denominator. And it also involves phase shifts, which is why i is here, square root of minus 1. So you get complex numbers out of this. Now, I never told you how to divide complex numbers. I told you how to multiply them. I did tell you how to divide them. Um, but I also told you how to raise them to powers. You know, it's just part of complex variables. You're not going to actually do this. But it turns out it has a very simple form. Over here, this fraction is plotted. This is an MTF being plotted. We talked about different ways to plot how filters work. This is the engineering way to plot how filters work. It's not wildly different than things we've already talked about, but I want to point out some differences. The x-axis is frequency, but unlike the plots that you get out of MATLAB, this is log frequency, right? Multiply by 10, multiply by 10. The y-axis, well, there are two y-axes here, because we're going to take our complex Fourier transform, and we're going to separate out the amplitude part and the phase part, OK? The amplitude part is in the solid curve and is using this axis, which is modulation transfer. Um, and it's modulation transfer in a decibel scale. It's the gain. How much is the signal amplified? So a gain in zero decibels means the output is exactly equal to the input. That's multiply the input by 1. A gain of minus 20 dB means multiply the input by 1 tenth. It's a log scale. 20 dB is a factor of 10. So this is a log scale where all the way down here is 0 0.1, 1, 0.1, 0 0.01. Okay, it's a log scale. Uh, so what you see here is that in log frequency, this filter is a low pass filter. It passes low frequencies and it rejects high frequencies. Uh, this is a log scale which uh, uh, has a slope once you get to the high frequencies. So it, it attenuates more and more the higher you get. And it attenuates with a slope of every time you multiply frequency by 2, you reduce the output by 6 dB, which is 2. So every time you double the frequency, you have the output more. Okay? That's what this slope is telling you. Uh, just like 20 dB is a factor of 10, 6 dB is approximately a factor of 2. Okay? Um, and it's kind of obvious over here. Once this factor is huge, it dominates this. I understand this is imaginary, this is real, and so you know there's some complex math happening here. But when this gets to be huge, it totally dominates. So every time you double omega, the fraction is getting divided by two, and that's all this is saying. That this approaches a slope of every time you double, you divide by two. Okay, and the corner frequency um, is going to come out of top. So where the corner frequency is, uh, so you know, in engineering terms, you ask when does it start dropping, and so when does it start dropping by a you know, criterion amount, so say 3 dB, that's going to relate to the time constant. So the time constant is in seconds, which means 1 over the time, so 
constant is in inverse seconds, and frequency is inverse seconds, cycles per second. Okay? So in this circuit, we have resistance and capacitance. And to the extent that either of these are big, makes for a long time constant. Tau is R times C. So R is a value, it's in some units, you know, ohms. <laughs> C is in some units, like farads. Uh, those actually are the names of resistance and capacitance units. But R times C comes out in seconds, oddly enough. And so as the R and C get big, you get a lot of blur. And if R and C, R and C are small, you get a small amount of blur. And that blur shows up as the highest frequency that gets through. So that if almost no high frequencies get through, that's from a high R times C. So this corner is basically uh, proportional, you know, where, where it turns down is proportional to one over tall. Okay, so you can design a filter for a purpose that you want by picking an R times C, take a resistor and take a capacitor and build one with a corner where you want it. Okay, let's take a break and continue on in five. Let's, let's continue. Uh, I know not everybody's back, but let's continue. Okay, so I said we want to design a filter to understand the auditory system. And the auditory system consists of a bunch of these critical band filters, these bandpass filters. And I've built something out of circuits that's given me a filter that I understand has an exponential impulse response, but it's a low-pass filter. So we obviously can't use this as the model just yet. So now I'm going to talk about what happens if you put two of these in a row. Okay? So this is an RC circuit. This is another RC circuit. I put this little device in here, which is called a uni unity gain amplifier, which basically just makes the second thing act independently of the first thing. It takes the output of the first thing and delivers it to the second thing, but doesn't let the second thing affect the first thing. So I just put two of them in a row. Which means I take an exponent, so the exponential, sorry, the impulse response of this expanded circuit, this is just two linear and shift invariant systems in a row, right? Which means their impulse responses get what? Done to them. The impulse response function of the first one and the second one, what happens to them such that you get the impulse response function of this entire system? If I put two systems in a row, what happens to the impulse responses? They are, fill in the blank. Impulse response one is R1, impulse response two is R2. What do I do to those two things to get the impulse response of the system? I'm feeling like I failed the last two weeks from the silence in this crowd. If you put two systems in a row, the impulse response functions for those two systems are convolved. The Fourier transforms multiply, whatever you do to a frequency in the first one then happens in the second one, that's dot star. But dot star in the Fourier domain is convolved in the signal domain. So you can get an exponential convolved with an exponential. And an exponential with convolved with an exponential looks like this. And if you convolve it with another exponential, it looks like this. And with another exponential, it looks like this. So no matter how many times you do it, you get an impulse response that's all positive, which means you still get a low pass filter. It's still taking a weighted average of the past. Uh, it's getting blurrier and blurrier every time you do this because it's getting more and more spread out. But you're getting something that is uh, that it has a shape. And that, as a model of let's cascade a bunch of these guys together, gives you an impulse response which is an exponential times a power function. And this whole function happens to be called a gamma function because these curves are the curves you get from a probability distribution that we will not use in this class. We'll talk about a lot of probability distributions in the next section of the class. One that we won't talk about is the gamma. <laughs> that is just one of well, one other family of probability distributions, but they look like that. Okay? Uh, and they come up in, in important places, but we're not going to touch on them. But I'm telling you that it's a gamma because it's going to come up in just a second. Now, it's take the Fourier domain and multiply them together. So that's why if they're in the exact same filter over and over again, you just get the filter we had before to the nth power. That's the Fourier part, is just dot star. This is the dot star right here, okay? And so that's what they look like. So they get sharper and sharper cutoffs. Uh, do I have that in a slide? I don't, but you remember I had before, um, I had before that the filter characteristic, you know, looked kind of like this, where this slope was 6 dB 
per octave. Divide by 2 every time you multiply the frequency by 2. If you put 2 of them in a row, it'll be 12 dB. If you put 3 of them in a row, it'll be 18 dB. So the slope will get sharper and sharper when you do this. That's what happens. Okay? So fine. That's another filter. We've designed another filter. But it's a filter that still is not a bandpass filter, which means it's not going to be useful for modeling the ear. However, now we can do something familiar to it. We can take that gamma function and multiply it by sine wave, point for point. What does this sound like to you that we've already talked about earlier, but it wasn't a gamma function that was doing the multiplying? It sounds like a Gabor. The Gabor function was take a sine wave and put it in a Gaussian window. Now, why am I not using a Gabor to describe the auditory system? What would be the problem with trying to use a Gabor as a model for the auditory system as a filter? Why would it be illegal? What would it not be that it must be if we're going to actually build it? It wouldn't be causal, because a Gaussian goes infinitely forward in time and backward in time. We can't do that. So we need to have a window function that will make the filter we want, but a window function that's causal. So the window function we're going to use are gammas, which start from time zero and only go forward. So it's the same idea as the Gabor, we're just using a different window. And we're using a window that's legal when the x-axis is time. Okay? And so this is called a gamma tone filter. It is this, which is the gamma function, power times exponential, multiplied point for point in time by a cosine or a sine. And when you do that, what's going to happen in the Fourier domain? Let's do that exercise. It uses all the rules that we talked about last time. So, um, that is a frequency response. Okay? So, uh, it, so here's a uh, uh, frequency, frequency, and that's a log frequency that thing that looks nice and flat and low pass. So the gamma part of the gamma tone filter is, you know, something that's low pass. And I'm just going to draw it arbitrarily like this. And I'll, you know, it's symmetric because Fourier transforms are always symmetric. So this is what the gamma gives you. It's not a Gaussian. It's a different shape. But it's definitely a low pass filter. We're going to multiply it in time, point for point, by a cosine. And a cosine in this world is this and this. And we're going to take this filter in the time... Yep. Sorry, what are we trying to do? I... I'm trying to find out what this thing's going to behave like in the frequency domain. Okay. That's what it is in the time domain. Why, I'm doing why? a Fourier transform for you. Okay. But I'm doing a Fourier transform using the rules we already taught you, so you don't actually have to use MATLAB. What's to what end? Like, why, why? Because I want to know whether this acts like a bandpass filter that looks like a cochlear filter. Okay. So... We have this gamma filter, has some shape to it, but it's centered on zero frequency. We're going to make a new filter, which is a gamma tone thing, which is going to multiply it point for point in the time domain by another function, which is the sine and cosine wave, which is just one frequency, positive and negative frequency. So when you multiply in the time domain, what do you do in the frequency domain? What's our rule about how the Fourier transform works? When you go from time domain, if you take two functions, f times g, in the signal domain, when you go to the Fourier transform, f and g are combined how? Don't all shout at once. Transpose. Hmm? Transpose. Nope. OK. We know that f involved with g goes to Fourier transform of f dot star g dot star g. We know that one, right? That's the convolution theory. If you convolve in, 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 in time, you multiply the transforms point for point. But if instead you multiply point for point over here, what do you do over here? You convolve. This is how we got the Gabor's Fourier transform. The way we got the Gabor's Fourier transform, I'm going to use another color, 
So the Fourier transform of the gamma tone is going to look like put this thing here and here. Otherwise known as it's going to be a bandpass filter centered on the frequency of the cosine. Just like the Gabor. It's the same exact idea. And the same use of the same theorems. Okay? So we've built a bandpass filter, a causal bandpass filter. So it's the kind of thing you can actually build. Um, and it is oft used as a model for what the cochlea is doing. So if you want to model speech sounds and describe what the sounds are, and then you want to describe how the cochlea is responding to them, there's two different representations that people who study, for example, speech or hearing in general will use. One is to just say, at each moment in time, what's the basilar membrane doing? First of all, what's the signal doing? And then what's the basilar membrane or the auditory nerve doing? So the first step is just say, what's the signal doing at different parts of the basilar membrane? So that's called a spectrogram. And so what a spectrogram is, is it's a Fourier transform, except not of the entire signal, but of little snippets of the signal in time. So I'm going to take something that goes on for several seconds. I'll take, you know, say 100 milliseconds of it, compute a Fourier transform, and plot it for you. Then I'll take the next 100 milliseconds, compute a Fourier transform, and plot it for you. And do this over and over again, going forward in time. So at each moment in time, what's plotted here is, for various frequencies, how much energy is there. It's the amplitude spectrum. Phase is being dropped here. And phase is not a very important for hearing anyway, except in relative phase between the two ears. Okay? And so what you're seeing here is a sentence, children like strawberries. And above it, what the spectrum of the sound is at various points in time. So if you're going to understand speech processing or other auditory processing, you want to understand what the signal is. Here's a picture of the signal as it transforms over time. And you see that when there is a vowel sound like uh or i or ah uh going to e, this is an ah uh and this is an e, the spectrum has these peaks. Why does it have peaks? Because when you say a vowel sound, your mouth is mostly open, your vocal cords are vibrating, so there's a fundamental frequency which is so, yeah, somewhat visible in here, I'll talk about that in a second. So you have a forcing function which is first noise <sighs> coming from your lungs, then you've got these flaps here for a vowel sound, they're vibrating, so put your hand on your, uh, everybody put your hands on your ear and go ah, uh, and you can feel it right there, it's vibrating under your hands, so that's your vocal cords vibrating, that are vibrating at the pitch you are you're speaking, so you go ah, it's supposed to ah, it'll start vibrating at a lower frequency. Okay, so that's a forcing function. That then goes through your vocal tract. Your vocal tract has behind your tongue, in front of your tongue, behind your teeth, through the lips. It has various tubes with various sizes, which act like filters, which emphasize this frequency, this frequency, this frequency. These are called formants. And they are telling you which vowel am I listening to. So when there is a voiced uh, vowel sound, you'll have continuous output for a period of time and the continuous output will have peaks at different frequencies, and where the peaks are in the frequency spectrum will tell you whether it's an uh, I, or a U, or an A, or an E, or an A, U, A, U, it's changing, okay? The fact that it transitions means you have a diphthong, you have two vowels. Um, when you have a consonant that closes the airway completely, like K, when you get to a you close off your vocal tract entirely. You do it at the back of your palate, as opposed to a T, which is the back of your teeth, or a P, which is between your two lips. So each of those consonants has a place where it happens, but if it's a stop consonant, P, T, K, B, D, G, all those six are stop consonants. They're called stops because the sound stops entirely. There is a silence before the K, complete silence. And then the K releases, and a K, it's aspirated in American English, so it has a little bit of a rushing, noisy sound, uh, which is sitting right here. Oh, this is kind of interesting. This is not preceding a vowel. I mean, do I have a stop? I don't know. It's strong. Yeah, nowhere here do I have a stop before a vowel, so I can't show you what that does. That's too bad. This is the closest we've got. It's got a little bit of an er before you get to the vowel. So anyway, T is a stop, and it releases. It has a big frequency noise, spread over multiple frequencies. And we're moving towards awe. It takes a while to get there. The transition tells you where you came from. So all these clues 
are in the spectrogram, they're in the signal. But that signal isn't delivered in this form to your brain. Because first, it has to go through all this mechanics and the basilar membrane. So the basilar membrane is often um, modeled as if you've got all these different channels, different places along the basilar membrane, and each of them filters the incoming sound, not giving you perfectly that one frequency, but a band of frequencies, often modeled as a gamma tone filter, the band test filter that we just developed right here, with different preferred frequencies depending on where you are in the basilar membrane. And so this is meant not for a speech sound, but for a continuous sound, to be what the cochlea is presenting to you, the outputs of these cochlear filters. This is uh, the instantaneous output, so what you're seeing here uh, are repeats over time for some, some particular sound that has multiple frequencies in it, but because it's spread across filters, at the low frequency filters, the repeat rate is, uh, is far apart in time, and for the high frequency filters, the repeat rate is really close in time. Another piece of the sound spectrum uh, that I neglected to mention or meant to are these, they're not very well visible in this version of it, are these little horizontal stripes. And we're going to return to that shortly, uh, but those horizontal stripes come from the pitch you're speaking. So if I speak up here, or so I speak down here, I'm vibrating my vocal cords at a different frequency, and when I speak a voiced sound, so not the but the t part of the speech, but the ah and the e, when I speak something that's voiced, they're vibrating, which means that the sound that's coming out will be periodic, will be repeating. So if I'm you know, speaking at uh, you know, 150 hertz, that, mean, that means every 150th of a second there's a sound wave, and then the next 150th of a second will be approximately the same sound wave, repeating over and over again. And that'll involve a spectrum where there'll be 150 and 300 and 450 and 600 multiples. We'll talk about that momentarily, but the point is that's actually visible in here, um, especially if the thing's set up for that. So we talked about filters of sound. Filters of sound come up in various um, uh, domains. Uh, for one thing, we build filters into our audio equipment. Uh, and so we analyze uh, you know, things you would listen to on audio equipment, say music, by its different frequencies, and we sometimes want to balance it uh, for the environment in which we're listening or the set of speakers or headphones that we're using to listen. So sometimes our equipment will have a bass knob and a treble knob. And what those do is emphasize the bass part of the signal or the uh, treble part of the signal. So here is an ancient and wonderful 1950s Miles Davis. And half Nelson. And, you know, here's the signal and here's the frequency spectrum where I literally took a Fourier transform from 0 to 2 kilohertz and I'm showing it to you. So now I can put that through a filter. Now, I did a really silly filter, a, you know, a, a low-pass filter where basically the lows get through exactly and the highs get thrown away completely. You'd never build one of those out of circuits, you know, it would have some kind of smooth thing going on there, but whatever. And if you do that, you know, I deleted all the high frequencies, which made the signal is now moving back and forth much more smoothly in time, because I low-pass filtered it, I blurred it. So the hi-hat is now missing. And it sounds like a token through this. As opposed to this filter, which is the inverse of this one, where I only let the high frequencies through and delete all the low ones. And so now the hi-hat will be there, but the bass player is gone. So a cute story, at the time that this was recorded and all the way through the 1960s when most people listened to radio on AM radios, which were monaural and generally carried around in small and horrible quality. Um, and so if you were going to try to produce a hit record, you didn't want that hit record just to sound great in your living room with a good stereo. You want it to sound great when you're sitting by the pool with your friends listening to it on a totally crappy speaker which means that every recording studio that had this big mixing board and the tape decks and whatnot to mix down a record and had these really quality speakers so that you get everything sounding just right 
also had a really crappy speaker that they would also direct the sound to to find out what it was going to sound like the way most people listen to it. Uh, and the balance had to be good for that. Okay. Now we're on ahead is towards music. So I have alluded to the notion that um, periodic sounds have special spectra. So we all know <laughs> from the last two weeks that if I put a sound wave as a signal, that in the forehead domain, it's just a spike. I'm only showing positive frequency from now on. Uh, these are slides from you know, undergraduate classes, so they're, they're simplified. If I have a sound that is not a sine wave, but has some complicated waveform, but that complicated waveform repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats every capital T seconds, then if you do the Fourier transform, which is to say you do a dot product of this with various sines and cosines, those sines and cosines have to have a period of capital T. So they have to either be one uh, cycle per T seconds, or possibly two cycles per T seconds, or three cycles per T seconds. But if they're three cycles per T plus a little seconds, that means whatever they correlate with here, later on they're going to cancel. And so what you end up with is that if something is periodic, not a sine wave, but periodic, it repeats exactly, its <coughs> spectrum will have frequencies of one cycle per T seconds, two cycles per T seconds, three cycles per T seconds, and so on. The spectrum will have what's called a fundamental frequency, that's the one at the bottom, and harmonics at double the frequency, triple the frequency, quadruple the frequency, quintuple, and so on. Okay, this is just comes out of the math, uh, and it's a fact of uh, life for every signal that's got a pitch. So, for example, here are two spectra, two signals in the signal domain, and their corresponding spectra, which look periodic the way I'm talking about it. Um, they are literally me. Okay? So what I was doing there uh, was two things. One is I was doing a voiced sound, and it was not perfectly periodic because I'm no machine. Okay? But it was approximately periodic, and so you got an approximately fundamental, uh, about 133 hertz it looks like, uh, and 266 and 400 and 533, and 666 and 800, okay? Integer multiples of the fundamental frequency at which my vocal cords were vibrating. Uh, a second thing I did is I moved to a higher pitch. And I didn't go to any old higher pitch. I went to a higher pitch of double the frequency. In music, if you double the frequency, you get the same note on the piano. It's called an octave. It means if I was singing an ah, uh, ah, uh, if that was an uh, yeah, that was basically an A. So if I was singing a, a, an A below middle C, then when I went up, A2 below middle C, when I went up, I was an A below middle C. Okay, it was the same note on the piano. Um, and what you see here is, here I have all these uh, you know, fundamental, all these harmonics, and when I went up an octave, I got the second harmonic down here, the fourth harmonic down here, the sixth harmonic down here, the eighth harmonic down here, the tenth down here, I got every other one. Okay? And so those are thought of as musically being effectively the same sound. If you and I sang a song together and your voice was higher than mine, so you were singing an octave higher than me and everybody else was listening, they were saying, would say we're singing in unison. There's no harmony there because you're fitting on my spectrum perfectly. There's no extra stuff being added. Okay? And so there's a reason musically they're treated as the same signal effectively, not just in Western music. In basically all musics, the octave is a consonance. It, sounds, it doesn't sound dissonant. It sounds crystal clear, fits together, no weirdness happening. Um, and so um, that's what you get from such a signal. Um, so again, um, you've got this fundamental, you've got these harmonics, and if you go to double the frequency, you're basically picking out every other. OK, now I'm going to switch uh, from these slides to another set in a second. Oh, uh, before we do that, we can use this thing. Oh, God, I'm going to do this behind my back. Wow, that's going to be hard. Um, I'll, I'll point at it, and then I'll bring it to me so I can actually hit it. OK, so this is, there's a million online keyboards. But I assume not everybody in this uh, room knows a lot or any music theory. So I'm going to teach you a very scant amount of music theory that will feed into what I'm going to talk about next. OK, now we're definitely with Western music because in uh, a number of other cultures, the scale is not broken up into the same number of pieces in the same way that we do in the West. 
uh, in your European influence music. In European influence music, we use this scale, the scale which is sitting on the piano. So on the piano, you've got these black notes, which are the sharps and flats, and you've got the white notes, which just have letter names, uh, which are not on here. This is, if you want to type this music, you're allowed to on this particular website. Okay, uh, this one has a dot on it. This is the note C. So it's C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. That's one octave. You just got back to C. Notice this is below two black keys. This is below two black keys. This is below two black keys. So all these guys that are below two black keys in music are called C. And if I was singing C, and you were singing C, so I said C, C, and you were singing C, we'd be all be singing the same note. I'd be singing this one, you'd be singing this one, and you'd be singing this one. And if we sang a piece together, when we moved up and down the keyboard together, we were always on the same note, the same place relative to this pattern, it would sound like there was no harmony going on. Okay? Now, when I did C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, I was doing the white keys, but there's these black keys in between. Uh, all these steps are thought of as being equal, but what I mean by equal is the discussion for the next 20 minutes. Okay? So, C, E, C sharp, G, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G. Now I'm going up what's called the chromatic scale. I'm not skipping any notes. To get from C up to C, the next C, I have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 steps. So in this Western thing, we have this scale we like to sing, the major scale, da, 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 which we think of as major. Da, da, bum, bum, bum. That's the major chord. It's the you know, basis of all of Western harmony, but there are other notes in between, and the steps that I take when I take a major scale sometimes are big steps, two steps, sometimes are small steps, okay? But the full scale is all 12. Okay. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this is, okay, we've split it up our scale in this way, and I've also told you to get from C to C to C where this is 128 hertz, and this is 256 hertz, and this is 512 hertz, actual numbers. Notice what I did. Every time I went up by the same interval, called an octave, I multiplied the frequency by 2. I, E, the musical scale, is also logarithmic, just like the basilar membrane. So music is defined in a logarithmic fashion. The frequency domain is treated in this logarithmic fashion. Okay. This is because the, the year is organized by a logarithmic fashion. Uh, we created the scale to match. Probably. Um, the development of the scale and how we tune it logarithmically is, the fact that we tune it logarithmically is probably because all of audition treats uh, uh, frequencies logarithmically. How we split it up into these smaller pieces is the part I want to now talk about. So we want to decide what frequencies corresponds to these 12 notes. And not only, you know, once we have these 12 notes, we know the rest of them because we just multiply them by 2 or divide them by 2. So that's quite simple. But how do you decide where those 12 notes should be and what frequencies should correspond to them? So to talk about that, we need to talk about how instruments tend to work, which relates to what I was just talking about with harmonics. Uh, is this the right uh, slide set? Uh, yeah. OK. So. Suppose I have a string. Here are six strings. Okay? Probably terribly out of tune by now because I just replaced the string. Yeah, it's fairly out of tune. Okay, here's a string. When you grab a string, you have a thing under tension, and you pull it aside, and then it goes back and forth. And it creates a standing wave, just like my belt did a moment ago. And that standing wave will be whatever you pulled up. It's going to go down because it's a, it's a, a spring, effectively, and it wants to be shorter. So it goes down, but it's got momentum, so it goes down all the way to here, and back, and back, and back, and back. Now, the sound you actually get is not a sine wave. It sounds like a guitar to you. It doesn't sound like just a pure tone. Why does it sound like a guitar? Because this string has multiple resonances within it, and it is filtered by this body, which is carefully designed to give it a lovely sound. If you took a violin string, put a bow across it, under tension, with no violin there, it would sound horrible. It's all that resonant structure of the wood underneath it that makes it sound beautiful. The actual sound of something scraping on a string is actually quite horrible. It's not a sine wave, it's a triangular wave, and it sounds miserable. It is shaped, filtered, linear filtered, by the body of the instrument. Now, the fact that it is going back and forth, I've talked about harmonics, multiples of the frequency. If I take that string and divide it in half, that's an octave. 
bum. That's the same interval I've been singing all along, saying that's octave. It's the same note name. This is E. This is E. Same as this E. Would be the same as this E too. Um, okay. That string has other modes it can be in that would be stable, vibrational modes. One is if there's a node here, and for node, then when this part of the string goes up, this part of the string would go down. And while this was coming down, this would go up, and this part would never move. And that would effectively half the length of the string, which I've just told you gives you an octave. If I touch it way over here, I get a standing wave like this, which effectively quarters the length of the string and gets you another octave. But I can put my finger in other places and get a third and get triple the frequency, which is not an octave. Or another place and give you five. And this is intrinsic in every instrument under the sun. So I can take the string and briefly prevent it from, from um, uh, vibrating halfway along its length. Create a note. Or along a, a quarter of its length, that's still an octave. So I've just done an octave twice. Bom, bom, bom. Okay, those are all the same note. But if I go a third of the way, that's not an octave, that's another note. If I go a fifth of the way, that's yet another note. So we've got this series that is intrinsic in every instrument you play. It is not just intrinsic in stringed instruments. This harmonic series is in every instrument. So a flute is an instrument that's basically a pipe that is forced to be at um, external air pressure at both ends because both ends are open. The part you blow into, the embouchure part is open. So therefore the air pressure right there has to be ambient air pressure. The last hole that's open, at that opening, it's open to the outside air. So the pressure is fixed at both ends. So you either get half a wavelength, a full wavelength, <laughs> one and a half wavelengths, two wavelengths. Those are the modes that you can get. So as a pipe, just like with a string, if you start um, small, Hello. So if you peel your fingers off, it's set to be Western music. It's set to be the C major scale. But that low note has in it, I'll go down to a B because it'll be easier, has in it all those harmonics. So that's a B. That's the second harmonic. That's the third harmonic. That's the fourth harmonic. That's the fifth, and I can keep going, but it gets painful, so I won't do it to you. But the point is, the sound of a flute is closer to a sine wave than any of the other instruments. That's why some people, especially at the high range of the flute, don't like to listen to it. It's a little piercing. But it isn't a sine wave. It has a timbre. It sounds like a flute, not like a guitar. When a guitar and a flute are playing exactly the same notes, that fundamental frequency is the same frequency, and we can equate them, give them the same amplitude. But then there are all those multiples, and the amplitudes of those will be different on a guitar than they will be on a flute. That's how you tell a flute from a guitar, is how much of each of the harmonics do you have. Okay. Um, right, so I did all of that. Okay, so last bit we're going to do, really quickly, is this notion of, okay, musicians across the years have you know, created scales and played music. The notion of having 12 notes in a scale, you know, did not start in the, you know, medieval period in European church music. You know, the ancient Greeks had scales that were based on the 12 notes per octave scale. They were there. But they tuned them very differently. And the question is, how do you tune the scale? What do you use to do that? Okay? So, Musical basics I've already talked about. You've got this uh, keyboard, it's got all these different notes on it. It takes 12 notes to, from, to get from one to the next. Uh, another piece of uh, the thing, so here's the C, D, E, F, J, G, A, B, C that I talked about a moment ago. Then you've got these guys in between, which could be either called one step higher than the note below, so C sharp, or one step lower than the note above, D flat. And we call them the same note, and our instruments don't allow us to play something different for C sharp than D flat. Not always true. Back in Bach's time, there were keyboards that literally had separate C-sharps from D-flats. Um, and there were reasons that they wanted to do that, which I'm about to get into. Okay, so perception of pitch, as I said, is circular. You get back to C, and this whole thing, whole thing repeats. So you know that ba, uh, ba uh, are different notes. You can hear them as different.
but musically you can also hear the way in which they're the same because they don't create a harmony. Um, okay, and finally we've talked about the, the, um, the um, log aspect of it. Uh, let's skip over this because I said all this already. This was from a, a different lecture where I hadn't introduced any of this stuff. Oh, that's the harmonics. Let me skip that. Sorry. Sorry, that's just what I just did on the flute. Okay, next thing. When two frequencies are really close to each other, and you add them, they'll start possibly in phase with each other, but because they're slightly different in frequency, as you go forward in time, they'll drift apart and they'll get out of phase with each other. So often the way you tune your guitar, uh, let's see, should I do that with the flute? It probably won't be all that audible. It's a little bit easier to do it here. Oh, actually, it's we'll do it this way. As I went up there. So, what you're hearing is something that is not in the spectrum, but is a nonlinear effect of your hearing, which is this is not a sine wave that's in the signal, but you'll hear it. And if it's really slow, it'll sound like a change in volume, like But if it's really fast, you all, you'll actually hear it as pitch. Uh, so it's called a beat frequency. Um, now, suppose you and I are doing something in harmony. You're playing C, I'm playing E. They have harmonics. If some of those harmonics are really close in frequency, this will happen, and it'll be audible, and it'll be ugly. And so the idea is, if we want to sing in harmony, sing multiple notes at the same time, not just the same letter name, but multiple notes, that harmonic series of note A and note C are going to interact, and if they get really close, you'll get some effects in the harmony that maybe don't sound so good. And so what frequencies you choose for the notes will affect what harmony sounds like. Um, there's, there's a beat, by the way, that's 256 plus 258, and you're hearing one, one thousand, and uh, you're hearing the difference frequency played. Okay, so the question is, what do we do with these other harmonics, and how do we treat them? So I told you that the odd ones sound like other notes, but I didn't tell you what notes they sound like. Um, so, bum, 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 bum. Okay, I'm singing the one, two, three, four, five. This one sounds like a different note. This one does sounds like a different note, but one, two, four, and eight all sound like the same note. Three and six sound like the same note. Okay? So the ones that sound that add stuff are three, five, and seven. Those are the notes that we've added. Three sounds like if the bottom note is, is the note C, uh, three sounds like an octave and a fifth above. It sounds like the note G. Five sounds uh, yet higher, another octave up, but sounds like the note E. And seven sounds like the note B flat. Now, what's special about those notes? In Western harmony, the first, third, and fifth note, bum, 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 is the major chord. It is the fundamental chord of all Western harmony. Um, the other fundamental chord is the one that pushes towards that, which uh, you usually start on a different note, but I'm not going to do a whole harmony chorus but is to add a seventh note to that chord, bum, 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 which to your ears should sound like the blues. Ba-ba-doo-bee, da ba do ba ba do bee ba ba do dee do da ba wee Okay? So that seventh note is a note that makes the harmony want to move somewhere else. Possibly come at ba ba do ba ba Now we've come to rest. Okay? In har musical harmony, that's a five to a one progression. In church harmony, five to one or four to one is the fundamental coming to rest at the end of a phrase. Um, so what I'm saying is, things that we talk about in Western harmony are already there in the spectrum of the fundamental note. And so one way to tune your piano is to decide, oh, I'm going to just use these multiples. So if I want to, if I decide what frequency F I want for the note C, so how should I tune G? Well, why not go up to the third harmonic, 3F, and that I'll call G. Now, to get it back in the same octave, octave I'll have to divide by 2, so I'll call it 3 halves. 
And then I can start with G and go up to the third harmonic of that and come down by half and multiply by three halves again. Call that D, which is a fifth above G. And just pick all the notes by multiplying by these integer fractions. And that was done by the Greeks. That's how the Greeks tuned their, uh, their instruments, their lyres or whatever. Okay? And so you use simple fractions like three halves to go up a fifth above. So seven little half steps up. You do that by multiplying by three halves. Maybe you're interested in having a nice simple fraction for some of the ones below as well. So you could go down a fifth. So up from C to G, sorry, from your perspective. From C to G, you could go by multiplying by three halves. But maybe you want the F to be really close also because you're using it in your music close to C. So you want to go down by a fraction. So here you go up by three halves. There you go down by two thirds. Okay? So you can go by these fifths, as the musicians call them, which is seven little half steps, and you can go by fifths and tune by just keep multiplying over and over again by some fraction like three halves. And so here is what's called the circle of fifths. So it's going up the scale always by seven little half steps. So you go C up to G, C da da da, da da da, da da da, da da da, and it's what I'm doing each time, so I'm going up by a fifth. Okay? So this happens to be the letter names you hit if you go around the circle always going up by a fifth. And if you do that over and over again, you know, pitch is circular, you end up back where you started. So you're not going C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. Instead, you're going around by seven steps, and then by seven steps again, seven steps again. Seven is relatively primed to the 12 we have, which means you visit everybody. And this is just what you get. So we have to decide, how are we gonna, what frequency do we pick for all this stuff? So let's pick a frequency for where we start, and then decide what's the ratio to everybody else. So if you do that, as the Greeks did it, you could multiply by three halves to get to G, multiply by three halves to get to, get to D, and again, bring it back to the same octave. If it gets to be too big, because nine quarters is bigger than a factor of two, so you come back down. Multiply by three halves again, multiply by three halves again, three halves again, three halves again. And you can go around the other way, let's say, by multiplying by two-thirds, by two-thirds, by two-thirds, by two-thirds, by two-thirds. But you have this problem, because you get, <laughs> by going this way, you get to F-sharp, by going this way, you get to G-flat, and now all of a sudden, F-sharp and G-flat don't equal each other. Because one of them is three-halves to some power, and the other one is two-thirds to some power, then multiplied by two or by half to get in the same octave. And so you have this problem. You've decided how to pick, tune all your notes, but you have a contradiction. Now. In early music, Gregorian, medieval, Renaissance, you know, music never strayed very much from a key. Which is to say, if you were playing in C, you know, you got to some of these notes, but you never got to these other notes. They just, you, you barely visited them. And if you wanted to switch keys from C to F, okay, we added a couple more notes over here. But you never strayed very far. Um, but in Bach's time, people who were trying to be more adventuresome in what they wrote, and people were also writing note, um, um, pieces in lots and lots of different keys. So you want to be able to write a code, you know, something in C major, but you might want to write something in G flat major. And so you want this thing that you've tuned, to be able to play a piece in C, but a moment later play another piece that's in G flat. I mean, they weren't doing changes of key in one piece that went all the way from here to here, but they want at least the ability to do so. And much of the music produced in Bach's time was church music, which means it involved organs. And organs are these massive devices that take somebody all day to tune the organ pipes by you know, moving little devices inside the pipes in order to get the pitch just right. So you're not going to go there and retune for the next, next piece. So the question is, how do you tune your organ? So in Bach's time, they weren't doing this anymore. This is, this is you know, near year zero, but by near year uh, you know, 1680, 1750, there were sets of frequencies that people were typically using. Uh, but nevertheless, they weren't equal temperament. Equal temperament would say, always multiply by the same thing, such that we get back where we started. Going back to the keyboard, going back to the keyboard, if I want a factor of two here, and I want to be logarithmic, and I've got 12 steps, then what do I want to multiply the frequency by to get to here, if I want all the steps to be equal? What do I multiply by such that if I do that over and over again, I get back to here? What's the math of something multiplied by itself 12 times gives you 2? What's the something? Answer, 12th root of 2. So if you tune your frequencies by multiplying by the 12th root of 2, it's called equal temperament. 
then all these steps will be equal. It doesn't matter where you start. You can go get back where you started. All the intervals are equal. That's just fine. 12 root of 2 is not a fraction of integers. It's an irrational number. So in Bach's time, nobody was using the 12th root of 2. But at that time, they were beginning to understand that that would cause this. Now, in Bach's time, they also didn't want equal temperament because ba 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 that's the major seventh that's going C up to B, which really pulls you to C. And if you want it to really pull, you want the B to be kind of sharp so that it really gives you an emotional tug. But if you decide to move the notes around so that the fifth is perfect and, and consonant, so the fifth really wants to be three halves, so you're in C, so you really want the G to be pretty close to three halves, because that's going to make the harmonic series just nice and gel. Everything's going to be in the same place. You won't get all these beats. So you want some of the notes to be really consonant, and the dissonant ones, you really want to give them emotional crunch. So you don't actually want 12th root of 2, because 12th root of 2 to the seventh power is not three halves. So everybody was inventing these tuning systems that weren't exactly equal temperament, and weren't like the Greeks, all fractions, but were something in between. They were all compromises. And there was a guy named Werkmeister, who lived in Bach's time, just a few towns over from where Bach was, who published a whole book on tuning systems, and introduced a whole bunch of suggested tuning systems. Now, what were the suggestions about? So there's this notion that if you write a piece in G major versus D major, it sounds different. Now, in equal temperament, it shouldn't sound different, because all the intervals are all the same everywhere. So if you just move the piece to a new key, just move everything up that many steps, all the intervals are the same. It should sound the same. But with an orchestra, with actual instruments, it will sound different because it will be in different parts of each instrument's range, and the timbres will change. But also, with the frequencies they're using for tuning, the emotions actually were different for different keys, and people really had different notions of the emotion of D major versus G major versus C major. Some were bright, some were a little bit dull. And I'm not even talking about the minor keys where you go, go da 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 instead of da 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 da. So the minor key sounds a little bit darker. But the point is, these 12 keys major and 12 keys minor had different emotions associated with them, and they wanted to preserve that in their tuning systems. They want to move the pitches around such that the emotional import of one key would remain different from another. So it turns out that uh, Werkmeister um, produced a bunch of tuning uh, systems in Bach's time. Um, and it sounds fairly likely, and people, uh, uh, people who um, uh, study this, um, it seems fairly likely that Bach was aware of this work. So Bach was using a particular set of 12 notes called quarter comma uh, mean tone, which is what everybody was using then, which still was a tuning system that if you wanted to move really far away, so if you tuned for Z major, if you're using this set of frequencies, if you move to G flat major, it would sound bad. There would be intervals that just sounded wrong. Uh, they referred to them as wolf tones, which is a wolf, they sound horrible. Okay? Um, and so the question is, what do you do about that? So one thing you can do about that is just use equal temperament. Equal temperament means multiply the 12 through 2 and everything's equal. But that was emotionally not satisfying to the people at the time. So it works mathematically, but not musically. So, um, okay, let's skip this. Um, yeah, so Pythagorean, I literally mean Pythagoras, who has his name on some of the Greek tuning systems, all this stuff uh, is separated uh, based on these three halves. Uh, what you're seeing here is numbers are uh, steps of one, uh, uh, logarithmic set steps of um, a hundredth of a tone. So these, are log so these are frequencies based on logarithmic steps. Uh, um, so if you do uh, equal temperament, you're going up in 12th root of 2. And th this is in steps of a hundredth of that in log. So equal temperament is just going up by 100, 100, 100 in a log scale, where 1 is 1 hundredth of a step. Uh, these are different tuning st systems that people used. Now, uh, here's the Greek system. And so now what I'm writing here is, if I go seven steps from here to here, how far do I go? So in this system, when you go seven steps, you always go up by 700. If I start from here to 800, it's the step of 700. So all the intervals are the same in equal temperament. In Pythagorean temperate, they're all really equal, except for this one horrible one, the F sharp G flat one, that I told you comes out wrong. 
okay? And so if you use this for harmony, I have a fifth to this, it just sounds like hell. It's nowhere near where it's supposed to be, okay? Um, I'm going to skip over some of these examples, so let me figure out how to do this. Uh, we need to run out of time. Um, but I want to get to the punchline, um, which is this. In 1722, Bach wrote a piece called The Well-Tempered Clavier, and late in his career, he wrote uh, a second book of it. And it's a book of preludes and fugues, one of each in every key. C major, D major, E flat major, F minor, every major in every minor key. So the 12 steps of the st scale, two, two uh, keys for each, and two pieces for each of the keys. Okay, so it's a book of 48 pieces. And why do you write this piece of music? Well, at the time, it seems apparent he was aware of the work of Werkmeister. And Bach was not just a you know, musician, composer, performer. He also would go around tuning the organs for the churches in which he was hired to write a piece every week. Okay? And when the man wrote you know, a mass or something every week, massive output. Um, you know, working composers back then really worked. Um, and so the punchline, since we're over time, is that the well-tempered clavier has two aspects of it. One is the name of the piece is the well-tempered clavier, not the equal-tempered clavier. So tempered is how to tune them. And it's, he's advertising well-temperament. He's probably advertising Werkmeister's, one of his tuning systems, probably Werkmeister 5, I think is the number. But regardless, a tuning system, which if you tune your instruments with this tuning system, music will sound good in every key. And how do I know that? Because here's 48 pieces. You can tune your clavichord keyboard uh, to this tuning system. Then you can take my book and open up to any page and play it, and it'll sound OK. So it's a piece that's an advertisement for a new, new tuning system, saying, everybody, you should adopt this new tuning system. Because if you do it, you can get away with playing in every key without having to retune your instruments. OK? Uh, that's where I wanted to end. Uh, there's some nice musical examples in here, but we're over time. So I'm going to take a lot. Okay, next time, major change of topic, we start probability theory. And to your major relief, you get to live without me for a week.